Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. And thank you for joining us for today's quarterly market investment update webinar. Uh, this one hour session is being hosted by MBI, the wealth management subsidiary of Councillor Buchanan and Mitchell. And our presenters today are Debbie May and Alex Selesnev. I'm going to go through a few quick bios and then some housekeeping items and turn it over to our presenters today. Uh, Debbie May is a partner at CBM and co founder and chief investment officer of MBI. Uh, she has 35 years of experience providing comprehensive financial planning and nearly 30 years of providing investment advisory services. Debbie is a certified public accountant, a certified financial planner professional, and a certified divorce financial analyst. She has been recognized nine times by Washingtonian Magazine for her financial advisory expertise throughout the Washington, D.C. metro region, including most recently as a top money expert in January of 2021. Alex Seleznev is a partner and a director of wealth management and financial planning services at CBM, as well as co-founder of MBI. He is a certified financial planner and a chartered financial analyst who leads the firm's investment management division. His professional focus is on comprehensive financial planning and investment management. He is also a regular presenter for CBM and MBI, including most recently for a March 7th presentation on social security for the Bar Association of Montgomery County. Uh, we are offering CPE for this session, and over the next hour, I'll be launching four polls. Uh, if you are interested in receiving a CPE, please respond to at least three of the polls. I'm going to launch a sample one now. You do not need to uh, respond to it. The poll should appear either on the meeting screen or in the chat box, so please be aware of where the chat box or excuse me, where the poll might appear. Again, please respond to three of the four over the next hour. We'll send out CPE certificates to those who are eligible over the next two weeks. Uh, for those of you who submitted questions uh, during the registration process, those have been submitted to our presenters and will be addressed during the presentation. But if at any point in time you have any additional questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat box and Alex and Debbie uh, will uh, respond. Uh, this session is being recorded and tomorrow we will send a copy of the uh, recording and the presentation slides. So I'm going to stop now and turn it over to Alex and Debbie. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, what I normally do prior to this webinar is actually look at the list of attendees and we have um, quite a few MBI clients here. We have quite a few tax clients who are joining us today and actually quite a few guests, meaning they were invited by one of our clients. So perhaps for um, some of you who are not you know, that familiar with what we do, uh, um, MBI is actually a comprehensive financial plan investment advisory group. Um, we provide essentially planning, uh, investment management and tax planning services. Um, there are seven of us at this point. We have four, uh, four advisors and four analysts. Um, we, uh, anytime we work with our clients, we always serve as a fiduciary, which actually eliminates very many conflicts of interest and we're fully independent. That's important too. Um, if you want to learn more, feel free to visit our website or of course, feel free to reach out to Debbie or myself. With that, let's get started. So usually for our quarterly market updates, we try to start with a little bit of humor and perhaps some of you will find it funny or maybe not so funny. But actually, this is what's been happening with, let's say, quite a few of our clients, uh, specifically in 2020, you know, to the most part in 2021, people had a hard time essentially spending money. They were stuck at home. They were not traveling all that much. And I'll tell you, uh, nationwide, actually, uh, people accumulated more than $2 trillion in savings. That's the official figure. Now they want to spend. They want to do things. Again, they want to travel. And now you have inflation, essentially at eight and a half percent, just like this thief, you know, who is staying behind the corner. Um, so we'll certainly be addressing that in our webinar today. Uh, so in terms of, and in terms of our webinar, just like in the past, we'll talk about the market conditions. Um, we'll talk about, you know, some of our specific or more specific investment ideas. We'll talk about the economy. And then Debbie will also discuss some of our top financial planning ideas. 
So in terms of the year-to-date performance results, um, what you're looking at on this slide is essentially some of the major indices, you know, domestic, large, small, um, small cap stocks, as well in, as well as international. Um, essentially, every major index is down for the year, somewhere between six all the way to 10%. Um, now, one thing to point, at, point out, and we'll dissect that um, when we get to that slide, a lot of the losses, I'm actually going to say roughly three, quarter, uh, three quarters of that, actually came from the growth um, side of the equation. And I'll, I'll um, explain what that means. Now, what is perhaps the most surprising, at least to, to those of you who haven't been following the markets all that closely, is the performance of domestic bonds. Essentially, as we speak today, and the data is as of yesterday, domestic bonds as a category are down by 9%, actually more than 9%. We also have a separate slide to discuss that and um, our thinking on that, but that can be quite surprising to some people. Now, in terms of the reasons behind that, well, uh, you know, there's this inverse relationship between um, interest rates and bond prices, essentially what happened since the beginning of the year, um, you know, the 10-year treasury yields, which considered to be the most important um, you know, interest rate um, interest rate metric um, in the U.S., they almost doubled. So that's, that's a partial explanation behind that. And again, as we speak today, uh, we're expecting four, six, potentially even seven additional rate hikes this year. And it's really not a matter of if it's you know when and how frequently. Um, in terms of the sector performance, uh, energy and utilities are the top sectors for the year. Um, energy is one of those um, you know let, let's call them inflation sensitive sectors. Energy and commodities in general tend to perform well when inflation is high, and then utilities, perhaps one of the uh, most conservative um, sectors, they're also in the positive. In terms of you know what's on the bottom. Again, I would say not surprising. Consumer discretionary and technology stocks are in the bottom. These are more growth-oriented, uh, more sensitive stocks. And as a reminder, those were actually the best performance in 2020, and at least in the first first half of 2021. So you see that rotation. Now, in terms of the market conditions, in terms of our market outlook, we expect to see more volatility in the second and third quarters of the year, depending on um, how essentially things transpire. There are two major drivers behind that. The first one, not necessarily maybe in this order, but the first one is this whole situation in Eastern Europe, which we'll you know, discuss in some um, level of detail today. Chances are it will have quite a bit of impact even on us um, you know, here in the U.S. in terms of the markets. And of course, the biggest, again, elephant in the room is exactly what the Federal Reserve Bank is going to do to fight inflation, exactly how, um, how quickly, how rapidly um, they'll be dealing with that. We already had two corrections this year. Um, the S&P was down um, by more than 10% in the beginning um, of February and then actually closer to the end of February. The sentiment, the market sentiment overall remains somewhat bearish in terms of the um, expectations. Well, they're mostly negative sometimes. That simply means that people are expecting a slowdown. And what happens in situations like that quite frequently, when things are not as bad, as people expect them today, when things improve even a little bit, every so often there is a possibility of a rapid recovery. Again, when this you know, level of, of uncertainty declines. In terms of the earnings expectations, you know, some people like to say, at the end of the day, it's all about you know the corporate earnings. Um, we finished the year, specifically the fourth quarter of last year, um, earnings were up by 27%, and that's year over year. So that's a um, um, Q4 versus Q4 of the pri prior year. In terms of the first quarter earnings, and we're still in the very beginning of that, they're usually reported in the first and second months of the following quarter, the estimates are significantly lower. And that's what I mean by saying, you know, the market sentiment is mostly negative. Um, the range, depending on who you're listening to, is somewhere between essentially 5 to 10%. The estimates are higher for the second part of the year. And then in 2023, they're expected to be somewhere between 8 to 10%. And by the way, there's two comments here. Markets are always forward looking. That's important. And in terms of the you know, estimates specifically that come um, from different corporations, they tend to 
essentially beat their own estimates, either on the negative side or on the positive. That's just one of those trends. In terms of the S&P returns, in terms of the market returns for the year, for, for those of you who know me, I usually really try to stay away from that. But since this is a in our quarterly market update, the estimates range somewhere between four to nine percent. That's the consensus estimate. Um, I the latest data I have is as of February. I just couldn't find anything newer than that for this webinar. Um, so we'll wait. We'll wait and see. Again, there are many factors that will likely impact these projections. In terms of the economic conditions, uh, this is one of those. Um, you know, challenging things for many people to perhaps realize, but overall the economy is actually doing quite well. Even you know, considering the market volatility that we've been experiencing over the past essentially three and a half months at this point. In terms of the growth rates for this year, well, chances are they will be lower versus 2021 and even 2020. So-called peak growth most likely happened somewhere in the middle of last year. Um, in terms of the business cycle, we, we tend to talk about that in our quarterly updates, but we're not going to go in much detail on that today. Uh, it, it's, it be, it's becoming quite apparent that we're now in this later expansion stage, meaning this is no longer recovered. The markets are now expanding, but at a slower rate than in the past. And then one of the things, and perhaps you noticed that, I certainly noticed that, um, this whole situation with you know declining new new COVID cases, uh, people tend to talk much less about it, which I would say is certainly a good thing. Um, hopefully things remain more or less the same, or maybe even improve closer to the end of the year. So that's a factor too. In terms of the U.S. GDP growth for 2022, we're expecting it to be somewhere between two to four percent, and this is real meaning adjusted for inflation. And by the way, these figures, um, they were adjusted recently downward, um, given again what's been happening in um, Eastern Europe. In terms of inflation, well, the current CPI or consumer price index is at 8.5%, which is the highest over the past 40 years, essentially. We have a separate slide to discuss that. And essentially, it increased by one and a half percentage points since the beginning of the year. Unemployment rates, that's certainly a positive. We're essentially at a pre-pandemic level of almost, well, it was a three and a half percent in February of 2020. We are now 3.6. Jobs are plentiful. And one of the statistics, always interesting to look at it that way. As we speak today, there's you know 0.7 employees for each available job. So there's a lot of jobs available. Uh, so the next slide here, this is actually one of one of my most favorite charts to discuss. Um, essentially, this is the so-called asset class returns quilt. It shows the performance of each major asset class, you know, each year from 2011 all the way to year to date. And then we essentially annualize it for you on the right side. So today, actually, I'm not going to go over this in detail. Some sense already covered the performance year to date, but two things to point out. Commodities in yellow, and we actually highlighted it in yellow on purpose, uh, they are the best performing asset class year to date. And that's that's not just oil, you know, natural gas, it's wheat, it's gold, it's copper, actually consists of 10 different um, commodities. That's a commodity index. Now, what's interesting, it also tends to be one of the, the most cyclical, more, most volatile sectors. If you look at the performance of commodities prior, to 2021, um, they're pretty much on the bottom for for a number of years. So be careful if you're considering, you know, increasing your allocation, especially at this point. The other piece I want to point out is the performance of so-called balance portfolios. You know, depending how what you consider it to be, but normally it's an allocation of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. I mean, again, there are different types. But typically, you know, mostly large cap stocks and mostly intermediate term bonds. And that's important. So this is the first time since I'm going to say late 70s is what comes to mind when over a period of essentially one quarter uh, bonds actually underperformed um, stocks, specifically large caps in terms of their negative performance. And that's important because if, again, if you study this chart, you would notice that this balanced portfolio, it's always been somewhere in the middle. 
meaning it would not outperform obviously the best performing asset class, but it would essentially never be on the bottom. So that's that's one of the things to consider if you believe that you're invested in allocation like that. I'm not saying you should change it, but at the very least, this would perhaps be a good time to review and at least adjust it. Uh, okay, excuse some, me, Alex. I'm just going to launch the first poll here. Uh, please check your meeting screen so, or the chat box. I'll keep the chat up or the poll up for about 30 seconds. Thank you. I will participate as well. <laughs> uh, I hope they right. know here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so what you're looking at here, this is also actually one of um, one of those interesting charts, it shows the performance of the entire stock market by style. Um, so you have your large, mid, small cap stocks, and then they're also um, divided into three different categories, specifically value, core, or blend, and growth. So what's interesting, this is as of the end of last quarter, and I'll tell you it hasn't changed all that much as of today, even though the market was down by more than 5% at the time, most of the loss or most of the decline was really on the growth side. I would say roughly three quarter was in the growth side. Again, this is technology, consumer discretionary stocks, um, you know, without necessarily going into too much detail. But when you look at mid and small cap stocks, many of those companies, they really have no earnings. In some cases, they don't really have any sales. So they, too, they, they tend to be quite volatile. On the other hand, if you look on the value side, mostly in the positive. We're talking about energy, of course, banking, you know, financial industry, real estate investment trusts, you know, or REITs, they tend to be more in the value or core side. So that part of the equation is in the positive. And that's interesting. You know, every so often I get that question, I actually get it you know, quite frequently. Is this a good time to invest in the market? Right. Well, we're not market timers. The answer to that question really depends on your goals and objectives, but you don't actually have to invest in the market itself. You can always select, meaning you can stay more on the value side, more, more on the growth, depending again on your goals and objectives. And now, can I, can I just ask a question? Please, um, please. Yeah. In terms of the value side, um, how much of the return do you think is related to dividends? Well, it depends on the category, actually. So uh, value stocks tend to pay somewhere between 2 to 3% in dividends, usually more than growth stocks that are less than 1%. Um, so that's a very good point. A lot of the gains actually came from the dividend income. Well, if I do, if I do this math, this is quarterly, right? So perhaps like less than a percent in dividends. So roughly half, roughly half of the returns came from dividends, which is, of course, very powerful because you get them regardless of essentially what's happening with the markets. Yeah. Uh, all right, so the next slide here, and this is perhaps the most simplistic, really the most simplistic representation of what's been happening with domestic bonds. I really don't want to talk about the yield curve because it tends to confuse many people. So with bonds, essentially there are the two most important characteristics. You can say three, but I would say it's really two. It's the bond's maturity, meaning you know you um, lend money to someone effectively, and when will that money come, come, will come back to you? And then the second piece is the quality of that bond, meaning it's a treasury um, issued by the US government, perhaps it's a corporate bond of, um, of investment quality, or perhaps it's a below investment quality corporate bond, they sometimes call them junk bonds. The third factor, which is you know at least partially important, is, is the coupon, meaning how much um, the bond pays, but it's it's really, you know, given the circumstances, it's not that important. So there is this inverse relationship between interest rates and bond prices. Again, since interest rates are expected to go up, if you look at the performance of different bond categories for short term, meaning those that mature in less than five years, one to five years, um, their return year to date is at essentially negative 4%. Intermediate term bonds, five to 10 years, that's usually, um, that's the benchmark, um, a little more than 9% essentially, and for long-term bonds, almost 18 percent i'm sorry so that just tells you something about it so there's really three things to point out the first one well if you invested in any of these bonds are you actually going to lose money 
Well, not necessarily, meaning with short term bonds, let's say they have maturity of three years, let's say you invest in a bond like that. If you hold it to maturity, you will get your principal back plus you know, the coupon rate. Let's make it two or maybe 3%, so that's fine. With longer term bonds, well, it's a little more challenging, right? If it matures in 15 years, you would have to wait for quite a while to get your principal back. But if you try to sell, sell sooner than that, well, chances are you would actually be selling at a loss. That's my first comment. The second piece, if you just look at the yields, at this point, you know, when they talk about um, a flattish yield curve. So by investing in, let's say, five-year bond, you're going to get something like two and a half percent. If you stretch to two year, uh, 10 years, it's only three. And if it's more than that, it's only 3.6. So it really makes very little sense um, to do that. And then finally, this is really the most important point. Um, many you know, people consider bonds to be effectively risk-free. Well, that is simply not true. Uh, perhaps it's been the case to the most part over the past, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 30 years because interest rates gradually went down, down, and down. If slash when they begin to go up, well, this is the experience you would get. Uh, inflation. So we, we covered this topic actually in our previous two um, webinars. And what you're looking at here, this is a shorter version of you know, for a typical discussion. So is this a major concern or perhaps intermediate term issue? And uh, I'm inclined to say that most people would agree that this is not really temporary or transitory, which is what you know, Mr. Powell claimed throughout most of 2021. So before we talk about different, different details here, I'd say the overreaching idea here is that for a developed economy like we have in the US, you know, in Europe, in Japan, Australia, other developed countries, it is quite unlikely to have this above average rates of inflation over extended periods of time, especially, and that's important, when interest rates are this low. Um, every so often when I say that in our client meetings, you know, the response is, well, what about late 70s and early 80s? right when interest rates when inflation was really high but interest rates were also quite high what is unique about you know our situation today as, as we speak today is that inflation is at eight and a half percent and the fed rate is essentially a quarter of a percentage point uh, so if slash when they'll start raising rates well chances are it will have some impact so what are some of the considerations behind the intermediate term idea meaning you know, two, three, maybe four quarters. Well, there's still quite a bit of demand for certain goods and I would say mostly services. Talked about this earlier, people want to travel, they want to spend money. Um, and as a result of that, perhaps um, we'll see even more inflation throughout the summer perhaps. Uh, now with the Fed policy, we're clearly seeing this reversal of I'll say very accommodative monetary policy. They already raised rates once. Um, we're waiting for their May meeting. There's a good possibility that rates will be raised by half a percent actually versus quarter percent, which is what many people expected. And I would say 95% chance that they'll also start trimming their $9 trillion balance sheet. That will likely have some impact. You know, there's this saying, don't fight the Fed. If they're trying to slow things down, well, chances are they will. Now, this whole situation in Eastern Europe, I absolutely want to stay away from, you know, estimating how long will it take and what the actual impacts are going to be. But if we see a resolution in the near term, perhaps over the next couple of months, then perhaps that will have a positive effect on inflation, mostly actually in Europe, but also in us here in the U.S. So under this scenario, perhaps we'll see something like four to five percent by the end of the year. Now. Under the persistent scenario, if you look at the unemployment rates of 3.6%, that is certainly a great thing, again, for the economy in general, especially if you're, let's say, on the employee side, you're looking for work. But at the same time, that creates quite a bit of um, wage pressure, meaning that if you used to pay someone $15 an hour, now you're paying them 18 Every other worker that joins that particular industry or perhaps even your own company, chances are they would want more, more or less the same wage and it tends to be sticking. Housing costs and rents. So sure, pretty much everyone knows that housing costs have been rising at a double digit 
percentages over the past couple of years. With the rents, it's actually different. They usually can't quite raise their rents that quickly, but at the same time, they tend to catch up over time. And that is, by the way, one of the arguments behind investing in real estate investment trusts or REITs is because they tend to create a pretty good hedge against inflation because they are essentially raising their rents. And of course, you know, the situation in Eastern Europe takes longer, perhaps a few quarters, multiple quarters, again, chances are it will have quite a bit of impact on inflation. So under this scenario, perhaps it will remain at more or less the same level by the end of 2022. So what is our opinion on this? And you know, we used to have that bullet point and removed it, we removed it from this webinar. Our opinion is that in both cases, you should be prepared for higher than average levels of inflation. If you're heavily invested in bonds, as discussed earlier, perhaps you should consider you know, other options. Um, creating hedges against inflation. Again, um, on the equity side, there's certainly some options that are available to you. So under each scenario, you should be really focusing on this. Now, regional conflicts, you know, what kind of impact they have on your investment strategy? And I perfectly understand that as we speak today, what April 21st, you know, it's always easy to talk about this in retrospect, and I'll explain what I mean. So what, what you're looking at here, this, is, this was prepared by LPL Financial, which we thought was very helpful. It describes how the S&P 500 index performed um, um, when, when we had the previous actually 22 conflicts. So on average, the total drawdown, essentially the total decline um, in the S&P 500 was 4.6% over the length of that conflict, essentially. It took 20 days for the markets to reach the bottom, and then essentially 43 days to fully recover. That is on average. Again, if you study this chart, you would notice that the range can be quite, quite wide in some cases. Now, the reason I said in retrospect, as we speak today, um, you know, pre-invasion, the S&P was down by a little, um, a little over 6%, actually, which is almost exactly where we are at this point. So in some sense, you could make this argument that the market's already almost fully recovered, at least here in the US, um, from the initial shock. And again, this unprecedented level of uncertainty that we experienced you know, post-invasion. There are always other factors, and I can't speak, of course, about every single conflict, but here in the US, again, what the Federal Reserve Bank is going to do, well, chances are we'll actually have more impact than, again, the, the conflict in Eastern Europe. So anytime things of that nature happen, anytime we have some kind of conflict, anytime you know things essentially happen, just like in 2020 when we had a global pandemic, I would say it's always a good idea to remind ourselves what is it that we can control and what things we really cannot control. And this is actually a short list. Market volatility, regardless of how hard you try, regardless of how closely you watch the markets or your own accounts, you can't really control it. And there is even the saying that stocks are inherently volatile. It's just what kind of stocks. Exogenous events. Essentially, again, this whole situation in Eastern Europe would be an example of that. Things happen. You know, we I at least thought that you know, it would not happen, but then it did. And of course, it has you know, an impact on the markets. Interest rates. We certainly cannot control them unless you you know, work for Mr. Powell, perhaps then you have a little bit of control. But the reason you have an asterisk there is that at least at this point, perhaps we can understand in what direction the rates are going. Well, I would say it's fair to assume that they are not going down. They're only going up. The only question is how much. And of course, investment returns. Again, regardless of how hard you try, you cannot actually control how your portfolio is performing. Now, what are some of the things that we can control or at least control to the most part? Your asset allocation. You are in control. Is it 60-40? Is it 70-30, 80-20? Uh, perhaps it would not make sense for you to make those adjustments immediately, you know, or, because you have significant and realized capital gains or any other factors, but you're in control. How well your portfolio is diversified, meaning how many sectors are included in your portfolio. You have control over that, at least to the most part. Investment selection, which is one of the reasons I actually showed you the performance of different styles year to date. 
meaning you can always adjust so that you're, you know, remain in the, the same percentage of equities, but you have different styles in your portfolio. And of course, our own behavior. And that's the main idea behind having a financial plan in place so that you understand exactly what would be happening in times of market volatility, exactly what would be sold to generate cash for your cash needs. Let's say you're perhaps in retirement and you need some funds from your portfolio. You assess what kind of impact is going to have in the long run. And most importantly is that you don't panic. That is the most important part because if you do and you start selling, well, in most cases that will, that will result in the permanent loss of the value of your portfolio. Okay, so, I'm launching the second yep. poll. I'll keep it up Please. on the screen yep. in the chat box for about 30 seconds. Thank you. Good. I need to yeah, and Alex, yeah. I just want to point out in terms of interest rates, um, I just, the mortgage, the average 30-year mortgage right now is 5.1%. Yep. <laughs> so that is definitely keeping up with uh, what's going on with the interest rates. That's right. That's we haven't heard those num that number in quite a while. For a while, yeah, yeah, yeah. For what I actually since two thousand five or two thousand eight, one of those, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So to to essentially summarize it for you in terms of our investment strategy at this point, um, you know, this time we we actually wanted to split it in essentially two categories. You know, in the past we've done this differently. So if you have a shorter investment horizon and um, I don't necessarily want to define it you define it yourself um, or perhaps you're in a distribution stage meaning again you're pulling funds out of your portfolio well in times of market volatility focusing on the execution of your financial plan is key because that's why you have it to make sure that, again that you're prepared for that now again in terms of market volatility usually it's not necessarily the most optimal time to make any significant adjustments to your portfolio that said though again the reason you see those asterisks there is perhaps you wanted to do that perhaps you wanted to transition from you know 60 40 to something like 70 30 vice versa that's that's a tough one but again market volatility creates you know opportunities to make adjustments quicker if that's what you wanted to do uh, rebalancing more frequently is a good idea usually in terms of our managed um, accounts we rebalance them at least semi-annually in times of market volatility we tend to do it more frequently so that we maintain our allocations at the same you know desired targets now if you're heavy on the fixed income side meaning you have a significant allocation to bonds one one of the points I, I was hoping that i made earlier is that perhaps you should really be focusing on shorter term bonds and you know for those who have been following interest rates perhaps you already made those adjustments but at this point um, having a portion in something like gold perhaps would make sense for you. Now, what's interesting behind it, and I'll just say it as is, um, gold has been a very poor investment in the long run. That's just the case. It doesn't seem to be appreciated in value all that much. Now, it tends to perform quite well in times of market volatility, and it also creates at least a partial hedge against inflation. And by the way, gold is up by a little more than 5% for the year. So at least so far this year, it's been doing what it's supposed to do. Now, if you're mostly in defensive or perhaps value oriented stocks, um, I would essentially warn you against over allocating to this category, specifically certain uh, no, more cyclical, more volatile sectors such as energy, understanding that it performed really well this year. But again, if you look at the charts, if you look at the performance of different companies, it tends to be quite cyclical. They don't just go up, up and up. Now, if you have a longer investment horizon, again, I'm, I don't necessarily want to define it for you. Uh, perhaps you're in an in accumulation stage, you know, in terms of your portfolio, well, consider taking advantage of the market volatility. Perhaps you wanted to have more in growth stocks, and that's when it really gets interesting. I don't necessarily want to make any, uh, any specific examples, but you can perhaps think of them yourself. Let's say that you thought that one of the top technology companies was a good purchase in the fourth quarter of last year. Well, now it's down by 20%. 
should you consider you know, allocating to that particular position? Of course, there are multiple ways you can do it. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, we do expect um, you know, more market volatility going forward, and usually this so-called uh, dollar cost averaging strategy, when you do this gradually, makes more sense versus just doing it all at once. So that's one of the considerations. Now, if my final point um, in our webinar today, we didn't really focus on international markets, you know, developed or emerging, but I'll just, you know, sum it up for you. Understanding that many companies or, you know, say countries are down by 20 or 30 percent, there's just too much uncertainty at this point, and we're really cautious in terms of finding any bargains. So at least what we've been doing on our end, we're maintaining our allocations, but we're not adding at this point. With that, Debbie, what do you have for us? Well, I'm wondering if we should look at the chat for a quick second oh, on everything yep, on the investment yep. side. I saw a few things pop up. It maybe it just makes sense to see if we've covered that or a few more comments about it. Sounds good. So here's um, uh, one question. And by the way, uh, when you type your questions in the chat box, I'll read them out loud, but I will not mention your name. It's just for privacy purposes. Um, does it make sense for a middle-aged person 10 years from retirement to invest in dividend-paying stocks primarily? Um, uh, when investing in dividend-paying stocks is important and why? Okay, would you like to address this question, Debbie, or would you like me to do that? Just making some comments here. Um, the, the 10 years from retirement is not what we would typically look at. We would look at how long you're planning to be drawing out your money over time. So you might be, say, 55 years old, going to retire at 65, but you're going to live till 90. So we need to think about your cash withdrawals, your need for income, and when is that going to happen? And that's how we design our portfolios. So um, just because you turn 65 or you've just retired does not put you all in a fixed income mode or not willing to, you know, to be in the market. The, the dividend paying stocks, I would say also, are going to be generally your more conservative stocks. They're dividend payers. They're not in a growth mode or smaller companies generally. So they would be considered more a more conservative part of the equity portfolio. Right. Do you have anything else on that, Alex? Well, the only thing I'll add, which just, just a comment, more of a side note, there are actually different types of dividend paying stocks, and that's important. So uh, like utilities, that would be an example of that. They usually pay somewhere between three to 4%, but you're really not gonna get that much growth out of them. Now, there are other stocks, again, I would rather not make any specific examples. They're usually in that core category, meaning they pay dividends, you know, one, maybe 2%, so not all that significant, but they have a history of increasing their dividends by five, seven, sometimes 10% per year. And what's unique about those types of investments, they also tend to provide a pretty good hedge against inflation. Because again, they're raising their dividends and that usually indicates that they have strong market positions and they can pass their increased cost essentially to their end consumers so that they can continue increasing their dividends again this is more of a side note yeah is there anything all else? right no other questions from the chat box now we had some um that were submitted to us prior to the webinar should we address them now or wait till the end uh, I think if they're investment oriented, maybe let's see if we talked. I know we looked at them, yeah. but I was going to make sure we touched upon them. Yeah, maybe. Okay, I'll start with one that was actually perhaps already addressed it, but we can talk about this more. Um, how will the rise in interest rates affect new and old bonds? That's actually a very good question. So um, I will start with old, meaning existing bonds. Again, what happens, let's say you bought a bond last year. Let's say it has a maturity of five years, I meaning five years from now, um, you'll get your money back. Anytime interest rates begin to go up, meaning new bonds will start paying more, your existing bond essentially needs to go down in value so that the yield matches the yield in the new bond. So for existing bonds, interest rates, I'm going to say almost always will result in at least temporary reduction in the value of your holding. Again, if you hold it to maturity, in my example, you know, five years, you're going to get your money back plus the coupon rate. 
3% or 4%. So you'll walk away with that essentially in your pocket. In terms of new bonds, well, they are essentially positively, right? Is positively impacted by rates going up. So if, you know, last year, let's say a bond paid 1%, now interest rates are higher than perhaps this year, um, bond from the same corporation, from the same company would pay you something more than that. That's that's how it would work. Anything to add, Debbie? Yeah, I just want to say one thing that I think is sort of overarching with all of this and with inflation is that what really matters is the spending power, right? I mean, we talk about earning 2%, 3%, holding a bond to maturity, but if you've got a 10-year bond and you're holding it, it's not going to be worth. You might get your money back, That's right? but it is not going to be the same money that you had to spend if you had something that was more inflation guarded, right? That's it's the spending power that really matters. And that's why we pay attention to something that can grow with inflation. I mean, even before we had inflation at, at you know, smaller amounts, say 1%, 2%, you'd still start compounding that and it starts adding up to something. Uh, that's, that's an excellent point, by the way. That's another reason why, again, I'll refer to them as bond heavy portfolios. They usually do not provide a good hedge against inflation. I mean, you can argue there are certain types of bonds that are better than, you know, so-called plain vanilla bonds. But in general, um, you know, chances are you should be seeking that inflation protection more on the equity side, or perhaps again with things such as gold. Yeah, and I would say with our portfolios, Alex, we use the bond component or what we'll call fixed yeah. income or non-equity as a buffer. It That's really right. is a buffer for your withdrawals. Um, so that you don't have to take money out in a down market. You're not, we're not planning on that. We're planning on using the buffer. So in that regard, it's not really about getting the nth percentage or whatnot. We're, we're going to recognize that it's not going to earn much, but it's our buffer. It's just kind of like our money in the bank for contingencies yep. and then some fixed income component for withdrawals. That's that's exactly right. Plus, since we're discussing this in times of market volatility, again, if you're trying to take advantage of what's happening on the equity side, using some of your bonds may make sense again, depending on your circumstances. So definitely right. different uses. Right. OK, so here's another question um, related to what we've been discussing today. Uh, projection of relative market performance U.S. versus Europe. Uh, would you like me to cover this one or yeah, want to comment on that? that? So given the circumstances, I of course understand why you're asking this question, given the situation in Eastern Europe, um, chances are, of course, European economies uh, will be impacted significantly more. Again, I do not want to project in terms of rates of return. I usually stay away from that. But I will say this, in terms of the economic ties, they're much more significant between essentially most European countries and let's say Ukraine and Russia versus U.S and Russia. And when I was um, originally looking into this, meaning right after um, the, the conflict started, uh, they're actually very limited. So less less than actually like 1% of the U.S. Um, exports, imports are to that part of the world. In Europe, it's significantly different. So how long this whole situation uh, takes will have much more impact on, on European companies, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's here's another question, which is again, I would say partially related to what we've been discussing. Um, interested in where the real estate market is headed, and interest rates. So, what do you think, Debbie? Well, the real estate market's got to cool off at some point, and we have different a variety of real estate, right? You've got personal real estate, commercial real estate, real estate investment trusts. And, you know, to Alex's point, I think in the long run, you're looking at an investment, excuse me, an inflation hedge and perhaps, you know, more income oriented types of real estate would, you know, keep up with inflation. But it's got to cool off at some point. I mean, you know, when we're looking at the personal side of real estate with it, with the interest rates going up for mortgages, with the fact that they generally have about a seven year cycle and we're in this incredibly um, long, well, has been relatively long increase in values of real estate, I think it's just going to cool off. Do you want to yeah. comment 
further. Well, so the I, I entirely agree with you. See, with real estate, it's interesting. Like now, I'm now I'm looking at purely from the investment perspective. Perspective. So Debbie described it overall, but I'll talk about it purely from the investment perspective. So REITs or real estate investment trusts, at least the ones that we've been following, they mostly focus essentially on renting their properties. And by the way, when I say renting their properties, I'm not I'm not only referring to residential real estate, warehousing. I don't know how many participants are aware, but that's one of the booming, um, how would you call it, sub industries. Um, of real estate warehousing. Again, their rents are expected to go up. Um, so usually, you know, as inflation um, goes up, usually they will start ra raising their rates. So in terms of the investment component of it, we we tend to like it. Now there are so-called builders. You know, again, I don't want to necessarily mention any any specific names. They've been under pressure mostly because of what Debbie mentioned earlier, because mortgage rates are going up. And anytime you talk about not existing um, inventory, but new housing, very frequently it's about the monthly payment versus the house price. So when interest rates are going up like this, you know, many people, specifically younger families, um, they can no longer afford it. So back to, to the cool down um, idea. Okay. So actually we have two more questions here. Great. <laughs> not sure if you can comment, but if you do, um, are you what what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Um, well, I guess I'll cover this question. Um, our thoughts remain exactly what they were, you know, six or 12 months ago. Uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Um, I would say that's that's pretty clear. Um, their valuations are essentially unpredictable. Uh, there are multiple arguments behind their uh, the reason why you'd want to have it in your portfolio. One of the white papers I read was one of the best, um, um, at least for me, is that yes, there is a potential improvement in the performance of your portfolio, but there are no diversification benefits. That's very important because that was one of the top arguments, meaning they would go, they would perform in a different direction. That has not been the case. So yes, you know, if you're lucky, perhaps it's going to improve the performance, but it doesn't improve diversification. Uh, can you please tell us about treasury series I bonds with annual interest of 9.6%? Um, do you want me to cover this question? Yeah. Yeah, so what those are, um, they, you can buy them directly from the um, uh, treasury or you can use a portion of your federal, federal return um, refund. Um, each person can buy up to $10,000 uh, directly from the treasury, treasury.gov, and you can also use up to $5,000 of your federal refund. So if you're married, it's actually $30,000. They adjust for inflation. The um, adjustments happen every six months. I actually thought it was lower than that. The last time I checked, it was like 7.5, um, but it sounds like they already bumped it up to 9.6. Um, so that's that's what those are, and I hope I'm answering the, the right question. So am I answering the right question? Oh, um, person who asked it, I believe so. So EE, their, their savings, I is inflation protected. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm answering um, the right question. All right, uh, so should we talk about financial planning? Uh, yes, yes. Um, I, I just saw the question come up. Like, well, we, is it good? Uh, you see, it's it's interesting. It's well, yes, it is good from that perspective. Um, one of the issues with it is that you can't really like include it in your portfolio. You have to keep track of it yourself, meaning it would be on the uh, treasury.gov. That's how you'd be tracking those types of bonds. And there's a limited quantity. Like I said, each person can buy no more than 10 or 15,000, depending on how you bind them. Um, they haven't been all that popular up until um, you know recently. Um, but yes, if you want to include some in your portfolio, I don't necessarily see any issues with that. Okay, I'm going to launch the third poll. I'll have it up for about 30 more seconds. Okay, and I'll click. So I'm going to talk about, I, I came up with uh, three topics that I thought were timely right now. Um, and it really, when I thought about this, they're all tax oriented. You know, tax loss harvesting, I'll talk about your withholding and tax estimating for 2022. 
and then Roth conversion and the famous backdoor Roth. I'll talk about that and I'll talk relatively fast uh, given our, our time, but um, I think I can do that. So tax loss harvesting, I think, confuses people quite a bit. Um, it, it first of all applies to taxable accounts. We're not going to get any tax loss deductions for retirement accounts. So this is purely about your investment portfolio that's in taxable accounts. We're, uh, this applies to unrealized losses, and sometimes we call them paper losses. It's just you're looking at your statement. Maybe you're kind of freaking out and seeing that you've got something in the negative, something's gone down, or you watch what's happening on the market on TV. And that's where the tax piece of this comes in, because what you're trying to do is just take the loss, irregardless of whether you like the investment or not, for example, and reinvest in something else immediately. And I'm saying immediately because this is not a market timing technique. This is purely about getting a tax benefit. So you want to go back into something similar and you want to do it immediately. And just to give you an idea of what this is worth, I mean, on a on a tax loss basis for taking a capital loss, the rates that apply to this that you know that you can benefit from is anywhere from 23 percent to 33 percent on the value of that loss. Now, this isn't something you're going to do for a $15 loss. I mean, we're looking at something that's relatively sizable, but the benefit is purely to save taxes. And if you leave that loss on paper, it's again in a volatile market in a few days or even a week, something like that, you could have that loss could have evaporated. So you've given up that opportunity. So you cannot buy back the same investment for 30 days, which is why you're looking at something similar. But there are a lot of similar investments when we're looking at large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, et cetera. There's a lot of similar type investments that would be of, of the same quality. If you can't, if you take a loss and you can apply it all against your capital gains that you have, that's other things that were sold that produce a gain, capital gain distributions. You guys probably all witnessed that in your portfolios last year and what happened at tax time a lot of gains were passed through because of the market conditions. So you want to take those losses and, it, and you can take up to a $3,000 loss beyond your capital gains, but you've banked it. So you can still carry those losses forward for the future, which is why you really want to take them in real time. When the markets are volatile, you really want to be monitoring this regularly. So this is not just something you do at the end of the year. Doing it at the end of the year is kind of a no brainer. But in the portfolios that we manage, we really do watch for these anomalies and these drops and look at the portfolios to see if we can take the losses and you know, take advantage of that strategy. Once the year is over with, you can't go back and, and undo the taxes that you had to pay. And actually saving those taxes that could be reinvested into your portfolio is going to improve on average about one and a half percent of your investment, right, of investment performance. So taxes are not nothing. I mean, this is something that you want to do. You're not, this is not about taking an economic loss because you're going back in the Sorry, market. Yes. This is not about, you know, uh, incurring a loss at all. And this is not about timing the market. I just want to say that this is about saving taxes. So moving on to the next topic, which is really about withholding and tax estimates for 2022. And I'll tell you what, what happens a lot of times when you're doing your tax return is you look back at the prior year and say, OK, we need to pay in at least the same amount of taxes as we paid in last year. Don't want to have a penalty. These words are pretty scary. Um, I want to make sure that I've paid in enough. But the problem is like with the year 2021, when the investment performance was incredible and the income that was produced that came through your taxable accounts was very high, is that you're likely to be overpaying for this year. So we're encouraging people now to, to actually look at where you're at earlier in the year and adjust your withholding. The withholding can come from obviously your paycheck, can come from a retirement distribution, or you might be paying quarterly estimates. Uh, I'm more in favor of trying to do withholding when you can do that and not do the quarterly estimates because there can be some danger in that. Danger meaning you forget it and you don't pay it. You pay it late. Uh, you're doing something in check form and the check is lost and you have these these extra added issues when you're doing it through withholding. Even if you adjust your withholding at the end of the year, which we do for a lot of people that they're taking their 
retirement distribution is the best example, and they're doing that in November or December. We take all the withholding that they need right from there. And the IRS considers that having been paid proratively, even if you'd started in December. So you could do all your withholding towards the end of the year that you're short, if you will, and basically not have any interest charge. The interest charge with the IRS, which is basically not a penalty as it's called, but it is an interest charge for failure to pay taxes timely. Penalties don't occur to your tax returns actually due April 15th, for example, but that's about 3% per year. So they are charging you some interest for not paying in timely. So adjusting your withholding and especially being able to do it closer to the end of the year can also, if you're still working, be after the fact that you've paid in all the social security taxes that you owed and now your net pay is higher. It can also be that you know where you are. So when you should go into the fall, we have a better idea of where the market's going to head for the end of the year. Yeah. You have a better idea of what your earnings are for the year. And if you've overpaid in some substantial way, you're not getting that money back until you can file your return and get that actual refund. So for people that have to go on extension for April 15th, that could be even much longer all the way to October. So the last topic, um, and I'll we'll talk fast, uh, which we were wondering if I could actually get this across in a couple of minutes, but I think we can. This is something, the Roth conversion, that's also very confusing to people, I think. First of all, to be able to contribute to a Roth, let's just go back to the basics. Your income has to be relatively low to actually contribute to a Roth IRA. And that is an IRA that's growing tax free. And your income, you can see what I have the limits here of 125,000 to 198,000 gross. So for a lot of people that can't contribute to a Roth IRA, but they're still going to do an IRA contribution, it's going to be non deductible in most cases. And we're talking about six to seven thousand dollars a year that you can put in. In that account, the non deductible IRA is going to grow tax deferred. You will pay tax on all the earnings as you take it out. The Roth, you will not pay any tax on the earnings when you take it out. And I'm talking about retirement for now, not getting into all the all the rules at this point. But so that's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to contribute to a Roth versus contribute to a non deductible IRA. However, I, we get asked the question all the time. I've got all this money in my IRA and I hear I should be converting it to a Roth so that it will I will pay the taxes now, whatever they are. And I'll let the money grow tax free afterwards. And everyone says that's a good idea. Well, anyone can do that, just so you know, regardless of your income level. But you need to evaluate this and you need to evaluate it with several different criteria, like you're paying all the taxes now. Is, is that really worth it? Am I in a high tax bracket right now? Maybe I should do that when I'm in a very low tax bracket. That's a consideration. When am I going to need these funds? So if you're basically going to not need the funds and now we're thinking about the next generation we might be able to do some math that says okay that's a lot of years that this is going to grow tax-free and it can even grow up to 10 years tax-free when somebody inherits it the ne meaning the next generation so maybe you could make some argument there perhaps you can actually do a tax-free conversion and there's something called the backdoor Roth which is really a loophole and if you're still working and you've got some money in your IRA, and I've done this with many clients right before they retire, where we say, you know what? You can move all the taxable portion of this IRA into your employer plan. I haven't run into an employer that didn't allow this. And then what's left in your IRA perhaps is the non-deductible part. It's, it's the basis. It's the part that you never took a deduction for, has no growth in it. And you can convert it the next day into a Roth IRA and pay no tax. Everyone should be evaluating this. You talk about tax savings. You talk about being able to take advantage of this privilege that otherwise may go away. I mean, we it was discussed in one of the last tax law changes, I think back in 2019, and we were ready for this loophole to be closed, but it hasn't been. So once you've done that, and it, let, let's assume you've never even contributed to a non-deductible IRA. A lot of people say, well, why should I do that? It's non-deductible. Well, you're getting money in a tax deferred account, so that's not the worst of things to have to link. You've left that in a taxable account. Otherwise, it's only six or seven thousand, I understand, but over time. And if you've never done that before, you put it in a non deductible IRA and then the next day you convert it to a Roth. 
it's very simple. And then there's nothing, there's no growth in there. So there's no tax consequence of having done that conversion. Hence, you can hear from what I'm saying, this sounds like a lot of loophole and it sort of is, but those are the rules and that's, that's the way it exists right now. You have to realize, I think, and Alex, you can comment on this, that taxes are very much a part of your investment okay. performance, right? Well, I don't think we focus on it enough, but whether you're trying to put your income generating things in a tax deferred account to avoid taxes, or you're trying to do some of these techniques with, you know, loss harvesting, Roth conversions, you know, making sure your taxes are paid attention to each and every year is so important because you can really improve your investment performance. And like I said, that's something with the years that we've been in the past few years where it's been so volatile that we're doing it much more in real time. It's not just let's wait till the end of the year and see where everybody's at. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add to that? Well, well le lemonade from lemons, right? Isn't that what they say? A absolutely. Yes. I mean, in times of market volatility, I mean, we talked about taking advantage or advantage of it or not, depending on your circumstances, but harvesting losses and potentially doing Roth conversions is certainly, you know, great considerations. We've done quite a bit of that earlier this year. Um, most of it actually happened in 2020, which is an incredible time to do that. And yeah. at least on the performance side, and, and it, it may again sound like a loophole, maybe in like almost like cheating in some sense, but you have accounts that perform at 20, 25% and they pay no taxes because all of those losses that we harvested in the beginning of the year essentially used to offset mm -hmm. all of those gains in the later uh, parts of the year. So it can be right. very powerful. Right. And the thing about the Roth conversion when you're still working and you're getting ready to retire, I think the extra nice thing about that is if you liked managing your own investments, you're like, well, geez, now I'm putting it in this employer plan. But guess what? You're going to retire within a year, let's say, or even shorter. You can you could take that money right back out and manage yeah. the investments in your IRA. It has to be done in that sort of progression. But um yeah. yeah, I think that's I think that's all I really want to say about that. Or do we have any more questions before we? Uh, yes. Well, how about two, two, three minutes of questions since we have a couple here? Okay. Does it make a difference if the IRA was a rollover from a 401k? Can it still be backdoor converted? Um, he, my short answer is yes. Um, but again, what Debbie was referring to, maybe you should, it, it's when you have that non-deductible IRA contributions, that's that's the starting point for, for that. If you don't necessarily have any, then you wouldn't be able to do a backdoor Roth conversion. Um, Debbie, if you want to comment right, you on really, that. Yeah, let me just be clear. I understand the question. First of all, if you had a rollover IRA that came out from a previous job that you're still working, you can most likely convert that into your new employer's plan. However, what is that getting you, is Alex's point. You need it to be contributing to a non-deductible IRA right. all along to say, oh, I have something left that I can now convert tax-free. So that's that's the point. Another point about that is we, we really pay attention to people doing those rollouts <laughs> before we've had a chance to do the backdoor Roth. You know, if you've already been doing non-deductible IRAs. I'll tell you, we've been big on non-deductible IRAs since the beginning of whenever they started, sometime in the 90s, I think, because it, most people didn't pay attention to that because it seemed so small and it seemed, you know, like it wasn't going to amount to much. But look at where, where we are now. I mean, between taxes and being able to do these Roth conversions, we didn't even have a Roth back then. So you just got to do what's available to you in terms of doing something like moving money into your employer plan. Let's assume you got a relatively small IRA. You've got seven, eight years before you're going to retire. You might still want to do that because you can then start putting the money in every year and flipping it six, seven thousand a year into the Roth, into the Roth, into the Roth, as long as we're able to do that. All right, so I guess one one more question and we'll finish on that. This backdoor conversion should be done before the change in administration or before a change in the law. Uh, uh, yeah, 
I'm going to say yes because we don't we, we never we're not going to be able to control if they change the rules, change the tax law. Whether it's the next administration, whether it's just something that comes up in a in a tax proposal, so I am always you do it now while you can. Because we don't know Fair enough it's coming down the you pipe. You do it each year. I thought it was yeah. going to change in 2019. And it didn't. So I think you want to do it and, and evaluate this sooner than later, frankly. It's Sounds good. And just to be clear of the IRA contribution was used to offset taxes. Um, uh, it can be converted, correct? Um, again, yes, you can convert it. It's just going to be a taxable conversion. So if you got a deduction for the contribution that you made, and if you may, if you're trying to convert um, that IRA, you will be paying taxes. Uh, the only time you would not be paying taxes is when you take in the backdoor Roth approach. And that's when, let's say over the past 10 years or five years, you've been making non-deductible IRA contributions. All right. Uh, so that's, that's what we have. We have, um, we always have, you know, new events coming up. Of course, our quarterly market updates. They're every quarter, essentially, usually closer to the end of the first month of each quarter. But our next webinar is actually um, about best financial planning practices for startups. So for those of you interested, it's on June 7th. Um, feel free to check it out. And again, on the, when you go on the website under events, um, you'll see everything else that is scheduled. Great. Of course, Thank you. if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Yes. Thank you for Time. attending our Thank webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.